Hello, and welcome to the Argyle CXUX or B2B Leadership Forum. My name is Eric Wallace with Argyle, and it's great to have everyone joining us today. I have some important information to share with you, then we'll turn the floor over to our esteemed opening keynote speaker. First, we'd like to thank, take a moment to thank our today's sponsor, Sprinkler. Our sponsored sponsors are committed to providing you with valuable content and a great overall experience. At any time during today's event, you can visit their virtual booths from the main agenda page, which include complimentary materials, information, and meet and greet opportunities. We also welcome you to stay socially connected during today's event. For those of you who are active tweeters, please use the hashtag Argyle Digital and follow us on Twitter at Argyle Exec Forum. Also be sure to follow Argyle on LinkedIn for special announcements. I'd like to take a moment to touch on our content neutrality policy, which we've curated based on the feedback we've received over the years from our members. We've worked closely with our speaking faculty to ensure that you receive a set of balanced and neutral viewpoints during the session today, and we appreciate our member support of this policy. Finally, and most importantly, we want to hear from you. So during each session, we encourage you to submit your questions and comments in the Q&A box on your screen. Following each presentation, we set aside time for our speakers to weigh in on your questions. Thank you again for joining us today. Let's get started. I'd like to introduce Jonathan Mann, who is Vice President of User Experience at Renaissance Learning. We're excited to have Jonathan today for his opening keynote presentation called, How Can You Design Trust in Algorithms When People Trust Their Gut? Welcome, Jonathan. Over to you. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> and uh, hi hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining today. As Eric said, I lead the uh, user experience team at Renaissance Learning. Renaissance Learning is um, one of the, and maybe approaching the biggest ed tech company in the United States. Uh, we're a B2B company primarily. And as, <clears throat> as the leader of the UX team, one of the many things that we're concerned about is increasing the efficacy of the teachers that we serve. And let me share the mission of our company, which in this case is quite relevant. So the mission of Renaissance Learning is an inspiring one, which is to accelerate learning for all children and adults of all ability levels and ethnic and social backgrounds worldwide. So we serve students, teachers, and administrators. And in this talk today, I'm going to concentrate on the teachers that we serve. And specifically, I want to talk about how we make recommendations to teachers, um, which, <clears throat> which in our view, and, and it, you know, backed up by science and research, the recommendations that we make are often quite accurate. And if the teachers follow the recommendations that we made, which are based on huge amounts of data, they're most likely to see student success. The problem is, is that sometimes the teachers trust their gut uh, which is a natural thing for the teachers to do. Um, but in sometimes in doing that, they're missing some of the recommendations that we make. So as the leader of the UX team, we not only, uh, our team not only wants to help the teachers use our software in the most intuitive and usable way, but we also want them to trust our software. So that's going to be the theme of this talk today. So to get started, let me give a little bit of context about algorithms versus trusting your gut or trusting your knowledge. So I'm going to talk about London cabbies to start off, which may seem a little bit irrelevant, but you'll get the point in just a minute. So let me show this video. Let's say you're in London. You need to get from the London Eye to Buckingham Palace. Taxi! <laughs> Buckingham Palace, please. We would leave on our right Belvedere Road left Chichely Street. Whoa, whoa, right wait, wait, you know the whole route already. Oh, well, we have to. All London black cab drivers have to have completed the knowledge. We need to know all the streets and roads in London to provide that service. All the knowledge it. is the test that you have to pass in order to become a London taxi driver. It's the toughest taxi test in the world. You have to learn 320 routes around London. So that's 640 quarter of a mile areas. You have to learn 25,000 streets and roads within a six mile radius of Trafalgar Square in London. You have to learn every single point of interest, place of interest, apartment building, housing estate, police station, mosques, synagogues, churches, everything, anywhere where a paying passenger may want to go. On average, it takes two to four years to learn the knowledge. One in five who attempt the knowledge actually pass. That's the same success rate as a US Navy SEAL. GPS and sat-navs are banned in the exam. 
but why not use them on the streets? My GPS is here, and if we get somewhere and we see a road's closed, we need to say, right, that's closed, but I know that if I go left here, that will take me there. If I go right here, that will take me there. We need to be able to do all that, as well as having a conversation with the person in the back and solving the world's problems at the same time. So quite extraordinary these uh, <clears throat> these London cabbies are, and I actually just happened to be in London a couple of months ago, and I had the privilege to drive with uh, or to be a passenger with one of these these cabbies. And the key thing that that gentleman said was, "My GPS is right here." He pointed to his head, um, and that that shows the, sort of the attitude. Like these are just extraordinary people, but they actually they they trust what's in their head more than they would trust like a GPS. And there might be some good reasons for that, but there's also maybe reasons to trust the GPS as well. So let's talk a little bit about that. So first of all, just to set context, um, I'm gonna briefly say what we mean by an algorithm. So algorithms are nothing new. And you probably have seen in the news recently, there's all this stuff about ChatGPT, which is an AI, which has, a, which has an algorithm, which actually has several algorithms behind it, but it goes all the way back to uh, the, the seventh century BC, uh, sorry, the seventh century uh, uh, today. So it, it originated hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of years ago. But our modern definition is that it's a series of instructions telling a computer how to transform data about the world into useful information. So we'll just use that as the working definition of what we mean by an algorithm. <clears throat> So there's a lot in the in the news today about algorithms. There's a lot of legitimate reasons why people don't trust algorithms. But why should we trust? And I, the key word here is what I have in parentheses. Why should we trust good algorithms over our own decision making? And I'll get to what I mean by a good algorithm in a minute. So first of all, this is a bit of a controversial statement. But studies have shown that, again, good algorithms in certain cases are actually correct more often than human experts for many things. And there's been a number of studies over the years, but one that I'll refer to goes all the way back to 1989. And the citation is down in the bottom there, which, which I won't go into right now. But um, Paul Meal did a study of clinical versus actual, actuarial judgment. And in this study, he actually found that algorithms outperform medical experts, judicial experts, financial experts, and business experts at certain tasks. And even when these people were given some formula to supplement their judgment, they still were beaten by the algorithm in many cases. Another reason is that human beings often misunderstand probability. And there's many, there's many things there, and, and uh, time's not gonna allow me to talk in detail about it, <clears throat> but some of the, the common ways that human beings misunderstand probability are not taking in, into account the base rate. So in other words, you might have heard maybe that there was a crime committed in a certain block in your neighborhood, and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm never going to go by that block again. It's super dangerous. But what you're not taking into account is the base rate, which is that you know literally millions of people walk down that block without anything happening to them. So it's vanishingly small probability that there's gonna be another crime committed there. Um, there's the availability heuristic. So things that you hear about in the world tend to have um, out, outstanding um, um, <clears throat> importance in your mind compared to their actual probability of happening. And then there's the conjunction fallacy, which I show here with this thing called the Linda problem, which was described by uh, Kahneman and Tversky many years ago some of the great behavioral uh, econ economists in the world. So the Linda problem, and please forgive the, the wording on this, it goes back to the late 70s, early 80s. So it's a bit outdated in the way that it describes this, this woman, Linda, but um, I just decided to use it as it is rather than modify it for you know, modern taste. So the Linda problem, Linda is 31 years old, single, outspoken, and very bright. She majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice and participated in anti-nuclear protest, which is more likely. Linda is a bank teller. Linda is a bank teller and active in the feminist movement. <clears throat> so the most, most people when they answer this question actually say number two, 
which is Linda is a bank teller and active in the feminist movement. And again, I apologize for this outdated language in this, but this is the, what they used in their actual study. The thing is, is that by saying those two things, it's actually far less likely that Linda is both of those things instead of just the first one. But people, because there's this conjunction fallacy that makes it more descriptive of who they are imagining Linda is, they say that it's more likely that she's both of those things instead of just one of them. So that's another one, humans misunderstanding probability. Algorithms can access a vast amount of data that humans can't, even with perfect analytical skills. So thinking again about our London cabbies, they might know all of these routes, but what they're not gonna know about is maybe like a road closure. They'll know how to deal with the road closure when they hit it, but the GPS will probably know in advance about that road closure and help you avoid it. And then lastly, Algorithms don't have bad days. So we as humans, even if we're amazing, and even if we often outperform the algorithm, you know, we might not sleep well that day. We might have an upset stomach. We might have things bothering us that are distracting us. So we can have bad days that inhibit our judgment, but algorithms don't. They're just computer-based and they work the same all of the time. So let's watch another little video. This goes back to the uh, movie, The World According to Garp with Robin Williams. Find it. Thanks a lot. We'll take the house. Garb. Honey, honey, the chances of another plane hitting this house are astronomical. See, it's been pre-disastered. It'll be safe here. <clears throat> so in that funny little bit, in, in case you couldn't hear it, he was he basically said. The house has been pre-disastered because this plane ran into it. So now it's it's astronomically small probability that a plane will hit the house again. But you know, so it's a it's a wonderful, funny movie and a funny scene. The reality is is that he's misunderstanding probability. The likelihood of a plane hitting the house again are the same as it was the first time. Um, you know, it's vanishingly small, but but actually. The fact that, it, that a plane hit it once doesn't mean that a plane wouldn't hit it again. And that's just another common human misunderstanding about probability. So <clears throat> why do people sometimes trust their gut over algorithms? There's many reasons for that, but I'm gonna talk about two of them. So one is that we often default to emotional thinking. And <clears throat> for those of you that are familiar with the book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, he describes system one versus system two thinking, where system one is the uh, emotional thinking that we default to, whereas system two is the rational thinking that takes up co cognitive load and makes us tired. Emotional decisions are effortless, and there's nothing wrong with emotional decisions in some cases. So you can see that little um, an, uh, illustration that I have on the right there of a prehistoric person being chased by some wild beast. If they didn't have the, uh, the, the capacity to make quick snap judgments, they would be looking at this uh, wild beast going after them and say, hmm, you know, let me analyze the situation here. You know, this thing is large and it has horns and it looks angry. Maybe I should run away from it. Um, and by the time they made that rational calculation, they would be trampled and possibly, you know, maimed or killed. <clears throat> so reverting to system one where they made a snap judgment to run away is the right thing to do. However, sometimes, especially when you're doing things that need analytical thought, you need to do the thing that makes us tired and takes more work, which is to use system two. And so we as humans often default to emotional thinking 
which sometimes makes us uh, make wrong decisions, whereas, a, a, as, whereas a, a, an algorithm is not going to do that. Another one is something called algorithm aversion that was described first by someone named um, uh, Dietforst, hopefully I'm pronouncing his name correctly. And again, the citation for this study is in the notes there. <clears throat> so algorithm aversion comes from the fact that people quickly lose trust in algorithms if they fail. So it might be that the algorithm gets it right 99% of the time, but one if it just fails one time, people are going to lose trust in it. Um, human beings often want to blame someone when things go wrong. And uh, sometimes this brings it forward also, like something went wrong, I'm going to blame the algorithm. And it's most common in people, going back to my previous slide, this type of thinking is most common in those who favor system one thinking. <clears throat> and you can see this, this little thing here on the right. This was taken from, I think, from Twitter, where uh, this was back in 2020 when it was difficult to get vaccines and they were being rationed and, and um, some people couldn't get them. So um, there was an algorithm trying to figure out uh, who was going to get the vaccine. And um, somebody said the, you know, the algorithm clearly didn't work. And these protesters were saying, algorithm suck, you know, F the algorithm. And that, you know, that's a common way that algorithm aversion gets, uh, gets expressed is, is it one time it maybe didn't perform as expected or didn't work well. And the algorithm was blamed just for, for pretty much everything. And let's look at this thing from, uh, from Jeff, Jeff Bezos. So um, how, how common it is to trust your gut. All of my best decisions in business and in life have been made with heart, intuition, guts, uh, you know, uh, not, not uh, anal analysis. Um, when you can make a decision with analysis, you should do so, but it turns out in life that your most important decisions are always made with instinct, intuition, taste, heart. <clears throat> So Jeff Bezos, you know, one of the most successful businessmen of our time is saying that his most important decisions were made with his gut, not through deep analytical thought. And uh, that would seemingly contradict what I've been, just been saying, and maybe it does to a certain extent, but I would say that for the types of large decisions that Jeff Bezos is talking about, um, an algorithm is probably not something that's going to help you out. An algorithm is for at least today's algorithms are primarily for small uh, contained decisions, not something where it's like, should I launch, you know, a, a, a e-commerce com company and sell everything I own and move to Seattle? Like there's so many factors to take into account that, you know, it probably does make sense to trust your gut in that case. Um, we're talking about smaller decisions, this or that, this thing or the other thing. Um, where um, uh, the algorithm can often outperform a human. So what I've covered so far is um, why algorithms can be helpful, um, why people often trust their gut. Let me just talk about, I had earlier referred to a good algorithm. And um, algorithms are sort of neutral but what the, the outcomes that they produce can be sort of good or bad for society. So first of all, you know, the algorithm has to work. So it has to perform as needed. But then there are some other qualities that I think are important to call out to say if something is a good algorithm or not. So the first one is that there shouldn't be any coded bias. And if you haven't seen it or heard of it, there actually is a movie out there called Coded Bias or um, <clears throat> and um, the uh, the producer of that movie actually came to our company and gave a talk about it. And what can sometimes happen, usually inadvertently, but it can still happen, is the people who are creating the algorithms inadvertently make the algorithm like themselves, and it can be sometimes biased against other people. And the, one of the very unfortunate things that can sometimes happen is in the medical field, as you can see there, Millions of Black people affected by racial bias and healthcare algorithms. Study reveals rampant racism in decision-making software used by U.S. hospitals and highlights ways to correct it. So I would say that 
Nobody intentionally did that. Most likely nobody intentionally did that. But nevertheless, bias was encoded in the algorithm, and that needs to be fixed for it to be a better algorithm. <clears throat> um, I already mentioned this. The decisions recommendations lead to positive outcomes. The other one I want to call out is that the algorithm shouldn't have unintentional consequences. And what can sometimes happen is with the best intentions, you create these algorithms, but you don't think about some of the outcomes that can happen from it. And one that I'll call out is you probably heard of the uh, GPS tool Waze, W-A-Z-E. What Waze sometimes did or does is route people through residential areas to get them to avoid traffic. <clears throat> And that might be great for the driver, but it was not great for the people in these residential areas who all of a sudden saw an uptick in traffic for their seemingly, you know, um, um, less used streets. So that was that's an example of an unintentional outcome that uh, decreased the efficacy of the algorithm for the world. So let me move on to something specific to my company. So. We, or my team, has done literally hundreds, if not thousands, of interviews with educators around the world. And um, one of the things that we hear from teachers when they talk about getting recommendations from our software, so we have a lot of data about students, and we can usually make pretty good recommendations about what the teacher should teach next, or who in her class needs extra help. The teacher often has this mindset. Here's a typical quote. This is an actual quote from an actual teacher. I, I trust what I know. I trust what I see. A test does not define a student. Some students are not good test takers. They're just not. When you see them every day in your classroom and you see them blossoming, you see them learning, you see the light bulb come on, you have to take that along with the data that you're seeing. So, <clears throat> Um, I don't know about you, but this is a wonderful, empathetic view from the teacher, and I would want to have this teacher for my for my kid uh, to 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 be their teacher. Um, the teacher is empathetic. The teacher is looking at the whole child, um, but what's implied in here is that they can make decisions above and beyond what the algorithm can can recommend, and sometimes that's the case, but not always. So. Our company has um, you know, what we would sometimes call big data. We have something called a learning progression that comes from data from millions, literally millions of students of assessment. And the algorithm has far more data than any one teacher to recommend placement and what to teach next. So sometimes the teacher, just by knowing the student, does know better than the algorithm. But sometimes that's not the case. And there's many examples of this. And I'm just going to show one example. <clears throat> um, teachers making predictions for college readiness. And so there was a study done, um, and Katie McClarity, who stated, cited in this, is a former colleague of mine. Um, a large percentage of students were considered by their teacher to be prepared for college, but 45% of those students would have been flagged by the middle school indicator that without any intervention, these students would not be college ready by the end of the school year. And this was with 90% confidence. So if the teacher fully trusted their gut, they would not be preparing a good chunk of students for college. And that, you know, that's an unfortunate outcome. So let's do a little design challenge. And um, I'm going to do this quickly. And I'm going to ask you to use the chat. I'm going to show you four examples of making a recommendation to a teacher. And here's the setup for it. <clears throat> Imagine there's a teacher, Mrs. Murphy. She's a middle school teacher. And we have data that indicates one of her students, Morgan, is struggling with linear equations. What's the best way to present this to Mrs. Murphy? So I'm going to show you four examples and ask you to pick the one that you think is would be the most effective for driving trust in the recommendation. So approach one is we don't make any recommendation at all. All we do is show the data to Mrs. Murphy and we let Mrs. Murphy make her own decision. So this is approach number one, no recommendation at all. Approach number two, the algorithm analyzes the data and makes a recommendation for intervention that Mrs. Murphy can assign to uh, Morgan. So we know, we know something, we're gonna make a recommendation to do this practice exercise to help Morgan out. <clears throat> approach number three is the algorithm 
analyzes the data, we make a recommendation to Mrs. Murphy, and then Mrs. Murphy can opt to do this, or she can opt out of doing it, and then tell us why she opted out of this. So that's approach number three. We're making the recommendation, she could either do it or not, and if she doesn't do it, uh, she could tell us why she didn't do it. And then lastly, we see some data that will help out Morgan, and we just automatically assign it to Morgan. So Mrs. Murphy is kind of taken out of this. She's just told that the algorithm made this made this decision, and she assigns this, to, or sorry, the algorithm assigns it to Morgan. So in the chat, please let us know which one you think would be the most effective. So version one, no recommendation. Version two, make a recommendation. Version three, a recommendation with the chance to opt out. And version four is just automatically assign it. I'm looking at the chat here and I see oh, all of you are saying number three. And uh, if this was more interactive, I would have you talk about why. Um, <clears throat> but I would say I actually agree with you on that. Um, and part of the reason is this, which is my final slide, suggestions for driving trust in algorithms. So there's many, um, <clears throat> and one of them is what we are trying to do in option three. So option three, what that does is it provides some sense of control for, for Mrs. Murphy. Um, even if it's insignificant. And going back to the author that I cited before, uh, Dietvorst, he wrote another one called Overcoming Algorithm Aversion. And in this study, which you, know, you might want to go to if you want to learn more about driving trust in algorithms, one of the things that's cited is providing some level of control, even if it's insignificant. <clears throat> another thing that you can do is to provide transparency to remove the perception of a, of a black box. But you have to be careful when you do something like this, because sometimes if you give information about how the algorithm is working behind the scenes, it could actually drive more distrust because you don't completely understand what's being said. And by revealing that, you can, you can sometimes be have, uh, um, <clears throat> you can sometimes be working counter to your, your objectives. Sometimes you, it's actually good, which is weird for a UX person to say, to add friction rather than removing friction. Because if you sometimes you add friction and you allow the user to have careful consideration, that can help them think through things and it can also help drive trust. <clears throat> um, and then, of course, proactively consider to address when the algorithm may be incorrect or perceived to be off. So these are just a few ways that we've been using to drive trust in algorithms. And I believe that's my last slide. Yeah, so thank you very much for, for listening. Um, this The presentation will be made available. And in the presentation, if you're interested in learning more about some of the studies that I've cited, I have the citation on the actual slides. So I think we had a couple of questions. Let me go earlier in the chat. So I see, how does using algorithms help with innovation? Seems like it's dependent on pre-existing data. <clears throat> so looking in the rearview mirror to help drive future decisions. That's a very good question. I don't necessarily have an answer to that of using algorithms help with innovation. I would say that it's it's actually, they're not contrary to one another, but it's it's true that algorithms is looking at past data and things can change. And so hopefully if you have an algorithm that can grow and change, that will help with innovation. Where do you think the balance lies between leveraging the benefits of algorithms while not totally? So that is the so the the question. Uh, where do you think the balance lies between leveraging the benefits of algorithms while not totally removing the human element? The hope is that actually that version three is 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 what one way to allow the human element. So what Mrs. Murphy is doing there is telling us why she's ignoring. The recommendation because she knows something about the student that we don't so she is helping to make the algorithm smarter so i think i've answered the questions in the chat is there anything else that i can answer all right well if not thank you very much for your time uh, if you'd like you can connect with me on linkedin 
Um, I really appreciate you all joining and for your attention, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks, Jonathan, for your excellent keynote. And I want to thank everyone in the audience for joining us today. This session, along with all of today's content, will be available on demand following the event. Thanks very much.